focusing on the spiritual works of mercy and how maybe I've experienced them in, in my own life and how I see them now as a Dominican, how li living out the spiritual works of mercy in our lives, or, or how we can do that. Um, there's, there's a list of the corporal works and the spiritual works of mercy, which are seven each. So I'm not going to take you through seven. So by, uh, if I'm 15 minutes in and I'm on number two, and you'll be thinking, oh no, there's five to go. <laughs> um, so I, I, I'm going to focus on maybe three of them that I think were more directly kind of uh, experienced in my own life and, and people kind of uh, being <coughs> exemplars of God's mercy in this way to me. Um, and so I'll focus on, on, on three of those and how we can, and live, like I said, how we can live them out in our life. And so when we talk about the works of mercy, for me, what comes to mind straight away is what's known as the corporal works of mercy. Okay, so bodily works of mercy. Okay, these are things that we do sort of unconsciously, charitable works, um, especially in the Legion of Mary, um, feeding the homeless, uh, sheltering the homeless, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the imprisoned, visiting the sick. You know, we all do these things, hopefully, as, as Catholics, uh, charitable works, and so these we experience more directly. But like I said, I'm going to focus on the spiritual works that are not as well as more as popular, popularly known, you know, but possibly more important in a sense, uh, because they're to do with the soul, they're to do with our spiritual life, and, and and helping people encounter the faith. So I'm going to focus on three, and one of them you might be surprised at, and it's quite difficult for all of us to do, but certainly one that I experienced, and, and, why, and the reason why I want to talk about it is because I experienced it very directly with someone in my life. So the three that I We'll refer to is the first is traditionally called to admonish sinners. So not kind of a, not an easy one to do for any of us. And so admonish basically means to to urge or caution or to warn someone that maybe they're going down a wrong path. Um, and it's pertinent to what we're talking about today to lead people back to the faith, lead people back to the sacraments, as Father Mark is talking about. And that's the most important thing we need to do. So uh, in our lives, so to to admonish sinners. That's the first one. The second is traditionally known as to pray for the living and the dead. And um, I'll speak about mo more about praying for the living because, again, that's how I experienced in my own conversion uh, and, and so forth. But praying for the dead is obviously, obviously a massive part of what it means to be a Catholic. Understanding that we belong to a church that's not just, not just here, but in heaven. And those souls are being prepared for heaven. So uh, a part of a whole mystical body. And the third one, just to finish off, I'll talk about uh, what's known as to instruct the ignorant, okay, so to teach others in the faith and uh, to have a sense of, to know our faith so that we can pass it on to others and how important that is. So those are the three that I'll speak about. So just to begin, what is mercy? You know, the Holy Father Pope Francis is called the year of mercy and we hear the word bandied around so much and sometimes if we hear things so much, the same word, it can lose its power and lose its meaning. Mercy, 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 we hear it all the time uh, and so it can become kind of an abstract idea, so hard to be saved concretely. So I'll start with a definition from um, your Dominican saints, Thomas Aquinas, who puts things very succinctly and, and, and helps us understand things more maybe concretely. So for Thomas, mercy is the compassion in our hearts for another person's misery, a compassion which drives us out to do what we can to help another person. Okay, so. I've got a fascination with kind of the etymology of words, words, where words come from. Father Terence, my student master here, is my Latin teacher, so I'll, I'll uh, show off to him a little bit for maybe showing some Latin. But the Latin word often gives, it, gives us an insight into what it actually means, you know? So I don't know if you've heard of the Latin word misericordia, you know? So we break that word up into two. So miser in Latin means uh, a certain sadness or unhappiness, and cordia means the heart. So. Merc to be merciful is to have a sadness of heart. So you see the condition of another person, and it, it moves you. You're feeling that it's not like a, you're not indifferent to someone else's struggle. You're moved because of the sadness in your heart to move out to that other person. And so this is what it means. This is the, the default position of mercy, that we should go out, not from a position of superiority, or at least take a step back, <coughs> and that we actually get involved in someone else's situation. Okay, so when we're talking about the corporal works and the, and the spiritual works, the corporal works, as I said, apply to maybe a more bodily situation, alleviating someone's physical needs. Okay, and so where do we get this from? Um, like all things, we return to the scriptures. Matthew 25. We're very familiar with these passages, but this is where we get the corporal works. 
where the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger or naked or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? Then the Lord will answer them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did, that to, did this to one of the least of these, you did it to me. So Jesus gives us the, the key to understanding the motive, what should motivate us in the works of mercy. Okay, so we do these works, not because primarily because we get reward, although the Lord does reward us in, in many different ways with his grace, but we do them because we believe that in the other person, when we're doing this, we're encountering Christ. Okay? That's what makes Catholics, that's what makes Christian mercy different to say a natural compassion for another person, just helping someone alleviate kind of material things. You're doing it because you see Christ in the other person. And that's what makes the act supernatural. Okay? So that's the corporal works. But now I'll, I'll tackle I'll tackle the, the spiritual works and I'll begin with the most difficult one to get it out of the way. Um, and the reason why I wanted to sort of begin with that. I'll sort of introduce someone in my life who has basically embodied this spiritual work of mercy to correct a sinner, to bring someone back to the faith. Um, she did it in a very gentle way, but often a very direct way as well. And uh, this is the, some of you have heard my testimony before, but this is really my sister, my sister, my, my older sister. Um, and so I had a very special relationship with her that she could talk very directly to me, and, uh, and she did at times. And uh, I suppose that's why she was able to maybe. Uh, bring me back in a way and tell me some home truths. So I suppose in a very real way, she embodied God's, the face of God's mercy to me. Um, I remember one, one of my favourite TV shows growing up was uh, a show called Catchphrase. For the sub, for the those from the south, I don't know if you had it down south, but um, certainly in Bucy, Northern Ireland, we had it. And uh, a guy from the north, Roy Walker, was the host. And his famous phrase was, "Say what you see." You know, to the contestant, "Say what you see in the screen." It's obvious. And this, was, this is my sister, in other words, tell it how it is. Don't be there in the bush. This is the situation, and this is, this is, what's, this is what's, uh, what's going on. So I experienced this firsthand for at least once a month. You know, when I was living, um, as Brother said, I played football for, for 13 years. And so when I was England and I, in England, and I was living the high life, and all the pleasures, and the, every, taking in everything the world had to offer me materially, and, in this wonderful way of life that was giving me so many opportunities, but maybe not using it properly. Um, I suppose a bit like the prodigal son, you know, taking the inheritance and walking away and uh, going to a distant country for me, it was across the water. But basically taking what God had given me, these great gifts, and maybe not using them in a, in a correct way. But my sister used to repeatedly phone me, once, once a month at least, um, and, and sort of she would say things like, you know, you know, the way you're living is not, you know, it's not in accord with the church teaching. And I'd be like, well, at this stage I'd left, I'd left my faith at 15. As soon as I left to go to England, I'd left it behind. I still prayed, but I wasn't practicing. So when she talked about the church's teaching and things like that, at first it wasn't, I wasn't able to really understand it. But then she would say things like, you know, the path that, you're lead, the path that your life is going down is going to lead you to unhappiness. And that's why I want to talk about unhappiness as a way maybe to talk into someone's situation who's further away from the church and doesn't really know the vocabulary that we use. Um, because our faith gives us happiness. It makes us joyful. It makes us, it gives us a purpose in life. So my sister, by saying, what you're doing, the way you're living your life is for you to be unhappy. I'd be like, are you crazy? I have so much money. I have nice houses. I have cars. I kind of, you know, I had a wonderful girlfriend at the time. Everything seemed to be perfect, but you're saying I'm unhappy. What do you mean? And, and so, it was like, when I think about it, why, what, what she was saying, it was like she was saying that she realized that she had something that I didn't have. And she realized even though I had the material riches, I was the poorest man on earth. Because she had something that I didn't have, and that was faith. Okay? And that faith gave her purpose, it gave her joy, it gave her all these different things. And, uh, and for me, she saw my sadness, although I wasn't able to perceive it. And she spoke into my situation. She had to act. And uh, so that's one way she did it, by phone calls. Another way was by books. Uh, I would see every now and again, Amazon coming to the post, you know, coming through. I'd be like, oh, nice book, what am I getting here? And then I'd open up the a religious book. And yeah, I'd straight onto the shelf. And uh, for a while, i just stack them up. And uh, this went on for a number of years, until, Eventually, at some point, God's grace, in a moment, 
I start to be curious, I start to pick up these books and start to read them again. So books, phone calls directly, but most of all, through prayer. I only realized this about six years ago when I returned from England. I asked my sister about, you know, uh, when I was in England, what, 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 was, what was she doing and what she thought about it, me as a footballer. And she said, the moment, that, the moment you left to get on the boat to go to England, I prayed for you every day that you'd return home because I felt that you had a priestly vocation as a child. Now, I don't know where she got that from because I wasn't a particularly pious boy or kind of by any means. But, uh, but I was so struck by this. She said, she prayed for me every day. And I have no doubt that I'm here standing talking now because of her prayers. So the reason why I say that as well is to never lose hope when you're praying for loved ones, family members. Prayer changes people's lives. But you might see it in your own lifetime. It might take 30, 40 years. In my case, it took 12, 13 years. But it was a real life-changing experience. She obtained from God the grace that I needed for my conversion. And I have no doubt about that. And so those are, those are the, the, the three ways in which she, emb she embodied that. And I suppose the reason why I'm, I'm focusing on her, what I want to say is that she perceived that no matter much, how, money, how much money I had, I needed to have faith. And that was the greatest gift that she could give me. And so that's the point I want to make, to, if you take anything away of today. Is, yes, we can do the corporal works of mercy. We can help people on a material level. But we have to be convinced that the greatest gift we can give them is Christ. If they don't have Christ, if they don't have faith, then we're still impoverished in a very real way. Okay, so if we're convinced of, of that, then all the other works take on a whole new, a whole new kind of reality. And so she was convinced that, that I needed to have Christ, and she was zealous in seeking me out, seeking out kind of the, the lost. Um, just a, a, a small story that I heard recently, a, a few months ago, just to talk about the importance of her and of giving Christ to someone, not just material help. It was about an Irish missionary priest who went to South America uh, and he was there for about 40 years and he helped the people build medical facilities, schools, uh, different programs, even like wells in the villages, all these wonderful, wonderful things. He did this for about 20 years and it was coming to the end of his ministry there and he recognized that you know, mass attendance was still quite low and the faith really hadn't taken root in this community where he was and so quite kind of a distraught about this, thinking, reflecting on his whole ministry, he thought, you know, what's, what's been the problem? So he made a very, he did a very courageous thing. Just before he was about to leave, he went to an old, an old lady in the village who had been there from the moment that he, he came to the village, and he asked her, you know, told her the situation and said, like, what's happened? What do you think I've done wrong? Or what, you know, why hasn't faith taken root? And the, it was a courageous question because the answer he got really was a moment of conversion for him. The lady basically turned around and said to him, that, Father, you gave us everything we needed except the one thing we needed most. You didn't give us Christ. Okay, so he was alleviating all their, all their material needs. But he had lost a sense of his primary vocation, which to be the, was to be the face of Christ, to be in persona Christi as a priest, to bring Christ to people. And only from that position can their life take on new meaning. So, so this was a conversion for this priest. And it's a warning to all of us, not just clergy, that we can, in this time and place at the moment where we're, there's so much work to be done, you know, that we can lose a sense of just being rooted in the reality of who we are in prayer and of, of being in Christ. And we can't get lost in that activism, doing so much <laughs> that we lose a sense of, of, of who we are. And so, that, so it must come from a place of prayer. And so this leads me on naturally to give the Legion a little plug. And uh, for those of you who are here from the Legion, so and to speak about the importance of prayer. In the, in the spiritual works of mercy, prayer is listed as the last, as number seven, which is quite strange, you know. Um, I, don't, I don't know if there's any kind of a reason for that, but it should really be the first, because everything we do should come from our prayer life. Only then are we sent out. Father Mark talked about the sacraments. We, we pray the liturgy, we experience the sacraments, and then we root ourselves in the Lord. So to give you an example, when I came home in three, 2009, after the 12 years of phone calls and books and all these different things. But I said, I want to go home for a year, reconnect with my family, my friends, all the people that I've known from childhood. So I came home. Within two weeks of coming home, my sister invited me to a prayer group and my brother-in-law invited me to the Legion of Mary, to the Morning Star Hostel. A simple invitation. At this stage, I didn't know how to pray the rosary. 
um, I didn't know the church was teaching, I didn't know why we believed the things that we believed. I was basically a blank canvas. Um, so he invited me down to the hostel, the Morning Star in Belfast, for those of, the, the, those of you who know, would know the hostel. And I remember walking through the doors, terrified. And some of the brothers are here from the Presidium there that I met. And for those of you who know the hostel, it has about five uh, flights of stairs. It take you about five minutes to get to the very top. And the roof, the, the room on the top of the roof, is where the, the brothers have their meeting. And I remember climbing those stairs, you know, curious, okay, what am I going into here, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and I remember walking in, and I'll never forget the image. Um, I walked in, and I saw 15 to 20 men on their knees praying the rosary. And this absolutely struck me like a lightning bolt for two reasons. First, all praying in the same direction, Statue of Our Lady, people ranging from like, the age in their in the 20s right up to like 80s even. So the, the age range of people, of the men who were all on, their, all on their knees, praying the rosary. And another reason was it was all men. For the ladies here, wonderful blessing that you are to us. It's often the, our mothers and our grandmothers that pass on the faith to us, and it's, it's given that you have the faith, you have a very particular insight into the Lord, access to the Lord that maybe men don't have, and uh, you often give us the faith. And for me, I never saw men pray. My dad was a, a prayerful man, but in a very private way. So when I saw 15 men on their knees, this was just blew me away. And uh, so I knelt down, pretended someone gave me a pair of rosary beads, and I obviously knew the prayers, but I sort of spent the whole time looking around, you know. What's going on here? But and somewhere inside, being so moved by it, that I, this was a life-changing experience. I went, I didn't, I went away from that place completely changed, and I couldn't wait to go back. At the end of the meeting, the guys got assigned their work for the week, the, the duty for the week. So I had a sense of kind of it appealed to my sort of masculine kind of sense of mission. You know, I have a purpose here. These guys are they're, they're serious about what they're doing. They're, the, prayers not just something they do on the weekend, you know, but this is like a part of their life. They're praying, they're our lady soldiers, you know, and, uh, and, here, and they're sent out two by two, like in the gospel, and they're sent out to do the work. And, uh, and I just couldn't wait to get involved in it. And that was a, kind of a, a concrete example of the prayer as an act of mercy. Ultimately, again, when we pray for people, it's not, we're not disconnected from people. It actually changes people's lives. And so, so it's not a very tangible thing sometimes, but it's equally as important as any of the acts of mercy. And so that was just a, a, an example of, uh, of the power of the, of, the, of, the, of the Legion meeting. And it reminds me of kind of a, a quote that I, I read about the Legion, which really sums it all up. It says, every time legionaries come together for a meeting, it is as if they are gathered at the cynical of our, with Our Lady, as in the days of the first apostles. Every Legion meeting becomes the upper room, the upper room at the top of the morning star. Where modern day apostles gather together in a cynical of prayer with Our Lady gathered round, asking the Holy Spirit to come upon them so that they can do great things for the glory of God and the salvation of souls. Okay, so this is not just to talk about that everyone should run off and join the Legion, which is a wonderful idea. Um, this is for all of us. So we gather around Our Lady. She teaches us who the Lord is. And she sends us out. Okay? And so that's a concrete act of a spiritual <coughs> work of mercy. Now I realize I didn't realize who when I was coming here, who I was going to be speaking to, was I going to be speaking to people who are strong in their faith, or maybe some of you are, are not so much, not there quite yet. Um, I was thinking back to last Sunday's Gospel, the, the prodigal son, that really encapsulate, encapsulates the different stages that some of us might be at. Okay, so some of us might be, resemble, like myself, the son who has left, left the church, left the father, left the inheritance, which is not just money, taken the inheritance and squandered it, which could be our faith, our spiritual life, left it behind, and gone off. Some of us might resemble that son. Another of us may have been resembled to someone who's turned around. You might be at that moment when you've turned around, when you've came to your senses, and you're making the decision to return back home. Is that five minutes? Ten. Oh, okay. so, <laughs> so, some of you might be on the way back home. And that's wonderful. <laughs> but some of us might be the second son. Some of us might be privileged to be the one who always had the faith, went to Mass, prayed, had just had the wonderful privilege and the grace of just always being in the faith. And yet, so, in some sense, that son needed to experience the Lord's mercy and forgiveness as well. Okay, so even those who of us are strong in the faith, 
Maybe we need to experience God's mercy in you. Maybe there's old habits or sins that we're struggling to get over, and we think God's mercy is, you know, it's just, it only goes so far. Maybe he's sick that I'm falling into the same stuff over and over and over again. And this parable tells us no. The Father's always waiting for us to come. <coughs> okay, so wherever you are in your journey, this conference today is a, is a, is a signpost to come back. The Father asking us to come back. And so this could be, especially entering into Holy Week, this could be a real moment of grace today. That, that, we're, that we're here and the Lord's calling us back. So I'm going to move on just lastly to finish off in the next few minutes uh, to lead into the third one, which I think they're all hugely important, but particularly as a Dominican for me, what I've discovered in my own vocation uh, as a spiritual work of mercy, which is to instruct the ignorant, okay? Because, I don't know about yourself, but so many of us, we were brought up in the face without really understanding why we believe these things. And so, is it, it, it can be obvious when we look around us, why right? there's such a lack of practice, a lack of faith, and the prophet, the prophet Hosea tells us, you know, the Lord through the prophet Hosea says, my people are perishing because of a lack of knowledge. Okay? So we need to know our faith. St. Thomas Aquinas tells us, the more we perfectly we know God, the more we love him. Okay? And it's so obvious on a human level. If we don't take time to get to know someone through prayer, through being concretely with them, then the relationship is severed. It can't last, there's no life in the relationship. But the more you discover the different facets of a person, like, a, like a, look at it from a different angle, a different part of a myth, the, the human person is such a mystery, the more you discover different parts of a person, the more you fall in love with them, okay? And this is why we need to learn our faith. This is very concrete. We need to be reading books, spiritual books, we need to be uh, feeding our minds. Uh, and this is something very, very beautiful about for myself, the Dominican vocation. Um, the St. Dominic left us. Okay, the, order, the order came out of a, a, a time of when so many people were, li were leaving the faith. It was a heresy at the time. They left the faith um, to join a sect because they didn't really know the truth of the faith and the beauty of creation of the body and all these different things. And St. Dominic was moved in his compassion to enter right into that misery and bring them back. And he was convinced that he needed brothers who were learned, that they knew the faith, that so when they told the people the faith, they presented the faith in a way that was beautiful and attractive, that the people would want to come back. They would see the beauty of the faith. And so, that's not just for religious, that's for all of us. And we all do it in prayer. So join a prayer group, join a lay organization, and form a group yourself where you study the catechism, you cut the faith, so that you're nourishing the mind. Okay, so our minds need to be nourished in truth, okay? And the truth's not an abstract notion. The truth for Christians, for Catholics, is Christ is a person. And so when you feed your mind with truth, um, your whole spiritual life comes alive. And so for, the, for me, this is a, a, a concrete act of mercy. And that's why I wanted to, 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 to focus on those three things. Okay, so just to, just to conclude, what's, what's, my, what's my aim in telling, in telling my own story? The acts of mercy, even the <laughs> spiritual ones, are very concrete in our lives. We can leave here. Uh, I wasn't advocating that you all leave here and go and tell all your family members that they're heretics <laughs> and they're, they need to go to confession and, and do which they might very well may do. <laughs> but especially with regards to correcting someone who's straying, we need to be very prudent. We need to know that there's a that the right opportunity has arisen. There's the moment's right that you've prayed, you've discerned that the moment's right, that you have a relationship with this person, that what you say might won't drive them away, but will bring them closer. So choose, the way you choose your words is very important. Um, and also that there's a chance of, of success. Okay? And you can do that in so many ways. By your example, but by your words, and by prayers, and by books, and by all these different things. Okay, so thanks very much for your time. Um, I think, I don't know if there's an opportunity for questions. Or... There's more than enough opportunity. Yeah, so um, thanks again for, for James for inviting me. And uh, I'd ask you very much to keep me in your prayers as I'm going into my maybe last year or two before ordination or a final vows. So thank you so much.